aren't we? We're in a battle. And I'm not talking about a, a Republican-Democrat battle. But we live as Christians in a battle. We live as Christians in conflict and we live in, Christ, in, in, in Christ in strife. Now I want you to, now don't, don't leave me on that. Let me, I'm going to need this anymore. I'm not saying that we're called to live in strife. I don't go to bed at night with my stomach in a knot. I don't go through the day with my nervous system in a knot. I'm not talking about that kind of strife. There is a struggle, but somehow I have peace in the struggle around me. When I watch those hearings, I know that God is God. I know He's on the throne. I know that He's able to bring to light truth and untruth. I know that God is able to, in His winnowing for to, to, to shift all of that stuff. And let what's good be on top. So am I interested? Am I praying? Yes. Am I a not? No. No. I'm not talking about being a not about your finances or about your kids or about what's going on in the world or world peace or global warming or any other such thing. I'm not talking about that kind of strife. But there is a strife. There is a conflict. There is a war that Christ has called you to. If you are a Christian, He has called you to this holy struggle. The struggle is not out there somewhere. The holy struggle that He's called you to is within your own heart. And I want to talk about that struggle. I want you, to, with the Lord's help, I pray that you will feel equipped, that you will be equipped. I have learned words that you might speak at the closing. I have learned that when we're winning the conflict within, we're walking in peace. We're walking in joy. We're walking in hope. Our wife is prettier. Our kids are smarter. The spaghetti is better than it's ever been before. And all those things on and on and on. If we're winning the struggle within, if we're losing the struggle within, then the world is a sad sack place. And this spaghetti is not as good as grandma made. And on and on and on and on and on. The question is not how to make things better out there. The question for us is how to make things better in here. Yes, amen. Amen. I want you to look with me into the Scriptures. I'm, gonna, I'm not sure how to start. Lord, I don't know how to start. Help me to know. I start lead by your spirit, I pray. Yes, thank you. The scripture takes some terminology and they use them almost interchangeably. I'm going to give you one and then see if you can track with me. Give me some others. If I said to you, the natural man, what would you say if the scripture didn't say the natural man? Let me give you an example. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Everybody, get, you get what I'm talking about? Do I need to do it again? But a natural man, let's call it but a fill-in-the-blank man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. They're spiritually discerned. Give me something to put in the blank. But a carnal man, that, that, that Scripture is absolutely perfect without natural, but carnal instead. But a carnal man cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. A person who is living in the blank man. Flesh. A person who is living in the flesh. Cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. 
So if you're talking about someone who's living in the flesh, someone who's living as a natural man, someone who's living as a carnal man, those are all three names of the same symptom. That's the self-centered, what about me person. And the Spirit, let me, give you some, let me give you some scriptures to help nail this down to you. I don't know if today you're going to learn anything new. Sometimes the greatest revelations I have, I already knew. But they, God didn't long within me, didn't put it in me. He didn't, I remember one of the greatest revelations I ever had came out of my own mouth and I learned as I spoke. If you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. It was when I was in the hospital. My heart stopped. No, I know. I've told that before. I'm in the hospital and I'm talking to this young lady and I said, does it matter which way I hold my hand? And she looked at me like, that is so stupid that you're asking me. She said, well, no, it doesn't make any difference. What difference does it make which way you hold your hand? I said, well, I've known a scripture most of my adult life, but I haven't understood it until just now. Paul wrote it. He was writing to a church that he really loved, and I don't have it memorized, but he was saying in redneck, my plain English, he's writing to the Philippian church, and he's saying, you know, I'd really, I'd really rather go on and be with the Lord. I think it'd be better for me if I could be with the Lord. When I think about that, I realize that for your sake, it's better that I stay. It's more profitable for you. And convinced of that, then he says, I know that I will stay. That epiphany of that, and I told her, I said, you know, to me right now, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a nickel's difference. If the Lord calls me home, there is no resistance in me. If he chooses for me to stay, there's no resistance in me. Because I love Him so much and I trust Him so much that no matter what He does, take me home or leave me here, my spirit says, yes, Lord, yes. And you know that while I was telling her that truth, my heart rate, I couldn't see the monitor. They had it on me. I couldn't see it. But in my spirit, I know that my heart rate did not increase when I said taking me home. There was no fear. And my heart did not increase when he said, leave me here. God wants us to be able to follow him without a change of heart rate, if you will. He wants to take the denial out of self-denial, if you'll good. let me say that. That's good. I was shocked when I did the pastors, my, one of my favorite pastors, one of my dearest friends, when I did his service, when I was preparing to tell about Brother Paul Cox, I love Brother Cox. He was like a little child in an old man's body. Once I was preaching in his church and he was sitting right there. And I was struggling. I was struggling. I thought it was stinking up the place and I'm just doing my best, my very best. And I've got no assurance that there's any help coming from from anywhere. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in my mind, they're all thinking, you know, I hope it's over soon. And I said something, and when I said it, the Holy Spirit touched my heart. And at that same instant, as though we were wired directly, the Holy Spirit touched my heart. Woo! He went that and kicked his leg out. <laughs> oh, I thought, oh my God, he gave me a little courage. And preached a little more, and I said a little something. Holy Spirit said, whoo, that fast. I mean, for her, it was just this exactly the instantaneous, the moment. And then I got a little more encouraged. I said something else. And whoo, it happened again. Whoo, it happened again. Whoo, whoo, and whoo, whoo, it happened again. I thought, oh my God, here's a little man. Here's a little short guy. It's really funny when I call somebody short, okay? He's <laughs> short. He's, to me, I can look down upon his blessed little bald head. <laughs> He's so much a child. The spirit would. Would, see, if he had screened it, if he had told me later, you know, son, the Holy Ghost bore witness at times in your message. I needed a little child. And God gave me a little child. And if he had to deny himself, I never saw it. And then I got to thinking about his life. I don't ever remember him denying himself. 
I know he did. It's the process. God speaks, you're going, do what? You have to deny yourself. When you get over it, then you do it. That's the process. But with him, the process was so short that it was almost, whoa, it was just, the deny yourself part just was over and done in, in less than a half of a whoop. Because he, he heard, he denied himself, and he did it all in one whoop. It happened because it happened to me. He whoop, just sat back. There was no time. Oh, Lord, are you sure you want me to be a fool and kick my holy foot out today? There was no time for that. The kingdom would have been lost if there was time for that. And it's that, it's that characteristic that I so want in my own life. And it's that characteristic we're looking for today. James in 3, verse 15, it says the wisdom. This wisdom is not that which come down from above, but it is earthly, natural, demonic. Now James is not one who stutters when he says it. If you read the book of James, it does not have 47 chapters. What's it got, five or six? I mean, not very many. And when James is talking, it is all fortified, power-packed stuff. And James doesn't say, he doesn't say, it could be, it might be, if the Lord would teach us gently. No, no, no. He is boom. Hey, this thing that you're, you're, you're putting your trust in, it's not from God, it's not from heaven, it's earthly, it's natural, it's, hey, let's just call it what it is, it's demonic. Natural and demonic and earthly and carnal, are they not all birds of a feather? They're all, they're, all, they're all different faces of the same thing, aren't they? You see, when our children are carnal, when they're, when they're let's talk about our children because God knows they need help to be like we are someday. When our children have an attitude, you know, we got to deal with it, don't we? Not because we hate them or we like to beat them, but because we got There's got to be a perimeter, those like those things in the bowling alley that keep them from, out of the ditch. And that's our job to help them, help them, and do that. Sometimes it's cute when they throw a fit. The first time they're able to say no and scream and jump on their back and kick the floor. Some people think think that's cute, but if you realize that it's. It's earthly, it's natural, it's demonic. You say, why are you calling my kid a demon? No, I'm not calling your child a demon. But I'm saying those characteristics did not come from God. God did not bless us with those characteristics. And so when you see it, even in its infant form, we want to nip it. But I'm not talking about our kids today, I'm talking about us. In John, verse, I can't read my writing, I think it is... 3.6 Maybe it's one six. maybe it's 2.6 That which is born of the Spirit is spirit, and that which is born of the flesh is flesh. The Spirit and the flesh, those are opposite, aren't they? The flesh is earthly, it's carnal, it's demonic. He says, he says in another place in John 6, 63, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh Profits nothing. The work that I, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. There is a struggle that goes on, but the struggle I'm talking about is the one that is between us. Our natural self, our self that was touched demonically in the fall. Is always against what God wants to do. That's so true. That's right. You say, well, I'm thankful I'm past that. Well, if you are, come pray for me. Because that's still where I live. God puts in my heart what to do. And, and i got to struggle with it. i got to say, Lord, are you sure? I mean, I need help. i got to know, is that right? Because what God asks you to do always costs you something. It always costs you something. God will have you apologize to the person who's the jerk whose fault it is. And He'll have you be the one who apologizes. God have, will have you give what you don't have to give. Wondering how the babies are going to get by. But God will, if God calls you to do it, He'll do it. But He won't do it until you can woo, just get on and do it. 
The struggle, the shorter we can embrace the struggle, the shorter we can ask God to compact the process in our heart, the more joyful we're going to be. Have you ever, have you ever wallowed in the land of indecision? Huh? Have you ever had, see I'm getting honest people everywhere. A few people are just looking at me like a cap looks at a new gate. But I know you're thinking. <laughs> Have you ever wallowed in indecision? Have you ever had something you believe you're supposed to do, but you're so opposed to doing it? Or let's let's give you all the benefit of the doubt. You're so uh, you can't imagine how God could do it through you. Let's let's put it that way. But you, and no matter how you want to dress up that pig, no matter how much lipstick, it is what it is. Have you ever wallowed in that place? How many people hope to live in that place for the rest of the day today? It's awful, isn't it? It's awful. Have you ever been in an argument and whether it was your fault or whether it was not your fault, God's called you to be a peacemaker and you don't want to be? How many of you have rehearsed what you're going to say to that jerk when you get in front of him? Come on, let's be honest. Let's be honest. Okay, there's life in a congregation. Wouldn't it be isn't it interesting that family right there? Well, I got a man on that preacher. Sure, we've done that. How many of how many have rehearsed the advice to the ch to children? Huh? You've done that? My hand went up first. I guess I'm, there's only a few of us. We do that, don't we? What are we doing? We're purposely wallowing in a land that where there's no blessing. It's, it's a waste of time. Yeah. Nothing good has ever come out of wallowing in that place. If you know in your heart what to do, why not just whoop, do it and get on with it? Do you realize you can cut your suffering time down to whoop? Yeah. Wouldn't it be great? How much suffering should you do today? Whoop. Well, that about did it today and yesterday combined. Mm. See, it can be that way. If you know the right thing to do, let me ask you something. Are you determined that in the end, sometime you're going to do it? I hope you're all going to yes. yeah. Do this even if it's not true. Because <laughs> I need to see it. Yeah. So if you've decided that God's will is what you're going to do in the end, why languish between now and then when there's no benefit? There's no benefit. Why not just suck it up and get on with it and whoop, do it and go from victory to victory to victory? Amen. Are you going to have are you going to have trials? Sure, but they don't have to be long. Have you ever had somebody and you know you need to forgive them, but the truth is you were wrong. Okay, you were wrong this much, but they oh my goodness, the heavens and all the earth above the earth below there couldn't hold all the wrong that they were. Now, I was in that one little teeny teeny thing. I was wrong. So what can you apologize for all the mountain of wrong they did or for the little teeny teeny thing you did? You languish in doing it because you don't want them to think that you were really the problem. It's hard to apologize when you say, I was almost not wrong at all. <laughs> I was wrong. Okay, it was a little bit of wrong. Okay. But you know what a centimeter is? Okay. I was like one tenth of one thousandth of one centimeter wrong, and my heart was just a little off skew. But you were such a jerk. But I forgive you, and I pray you forgive me. Pastor Dan used to say, I don't know if you want me to tell this, but he ain't here. He would say, Sometimes Brother Helm would preach on forgiveness and he would and he would ask people if they've ever had anything against them, somebody to go to them and ask for forgiveness. And so sometimes people would go to Pastor Dan and say, Pastor Dan, I need to apologize to you. I used to think you were a stuffed shirt and pompous and on and on and on. And but now I realize I was wrong. Please forgive me. Well, he's laying on the floor ripped to shreds. Can he forgive you? Yeah, but he's saying, why did they think I was this and that and this and that? And he's told me he's happened more than a few times. <laughs> you don't have to go through that. The Bible says to the degree that it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. That's what the Bible says. To the degree that it depends upon you. If there's half a sliver, that you, you apologize for your half a sliver. 
Well, what if they don't apologize? Well, who are they going to answer in the end? God or you? <laughs> I'd rather have an answer to God. That way I don't have to carry that rehearsal of what I'm going to say at their judgment. People live in things like that and it destroys them. It eats you up. I'm not a doctor. But do you know what happens when there's contention and strife in your body? And you won't let go of it? When there's unforgiveness in your life and you won't let go of it? When there's hurt and you won't let go of it? It's a spiritual cancer. It's a cancer to your body. I'm not a medical person. I can't say it leads to cancer. But it might. It'll lead to stomach ulcers. It'll lead to nervous system. It'll make you a grump on steroids. I know that. So why, why, why would we ever, ever want to languish in that land when we know what to do, but we just won't do it? Turn in your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 5. Now, we could use... We could use any one of those scriptures that I gave for the text today. But this one says it just, that's the one we're going to look at today. Now don't quint, squint, twitch, be nervous. Because I'm just now coming to the text doesn't mean we're just getting started. Where are we, where are we going? I'm in Galatians 5, 1 verse. Verse 7. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Where are you? 17. Galatians 5. 17, right? This, you, Is that it? 17? 17. I said 7. Yeah. Was it 17? Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was so easy to do. You're only one I'm sorry. You're I was only, only a few off. I was wrong. I'm sorry. I was really wrong. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm happy about being wrong and sorry. You forgive me? Hallelujah. There's blessing in the house of God. I'm going to change my notes. Oh, it's okay. I never look back at it again. Galatians 5.17 For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things you please. Now in another version, it, it says it just a little bit differently, but here's the idea. There is a battle. <coughs> it is continued, continuous. It is constant. It is between the things of God and the things of the flesh. The things of God against the carnal nature, against the natural man, against the demonic influence in your life. However you want, those are interchangeable. This struggle goes on continually. It can be a long struggle as we've talked about, or it can be a whoo and be over as we've talked about. That's in your hands. That is not in God's hands. You say, well, it's all in God's hands. That's not in God's hands. That's in your hands. He's given you the ability to work and be done. That ability is yours. If you don't take it, He'll let you suffer. I have a friend that wrote a song. We're going to have to take another lap around Mount Sinai till we've learned our lesson. How many times you want to lap around Mount Sinai? How many more places you've got to move and camp, move and camp, move and camp, move and camp? Until you can just learn to believe in God and get over it and do it. That's what this whole message is about. That's so simple, isn't it? I don't want you to be blown away when you feel that conflict. That conflict doesn't mean you're a bad person. That means that you've got a natural desire and God's got a holy desire and He's giving you His holy direction because He wholly wants to help you. And He wants to make you live a holy life. All of His power is in that holy direction that He is giving you. Whether it's to give or apologize or go or sell or buy or stay or whatever that direction is. Whenever you sense that, that I want this and 
I've got this sense that God wants this. Whenever you sense that, you're standing at the door of the kingdom of God in your life. Mary Lou prays more than any other person I know this phrase. And it's not a bad thing. She prayed, Lord, we just want your kingdom to come. We just want your will to be done more than anything. She must have prayed that four or five times this morning. It's one of the greatest ways you can pray. Because that's it. When you find this thing, if that is your real heart, then you quit opposition and the kingdom of God moves forward. Until you do, there's a stalemate in your life. God's got a plan. You've got a natural plan. They are not the same. They're odds to one another. And God could overpower you. He could squash you like an 18-wheeler a hog uh, squashes a cockroach. But He won't. Because He wants you. He wants you to walk with Him. And He's trying to teach us to walk with Him. And so He'll just stay there. I need to tell you something though. The longer you resist, the less you'll press. Mm -hmm. If you found something and you know you need to do it and you haven't done 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 it, you will come to the place when that you're not even convicted about that anymore. And I'm here to tell you, you're closer to spiritual death than you've got any clue. When God removes His conviction from you and you think everything's okay now because He's not striking me dead, and I'm going to go ahead and do what I've always wanted to do. You're, you're walking through the door of spiritual death. And unless God can reach a hold in your heart, you're toast. I've told this story but I have no other story like it. I once said a critical word about a person. I, I did it craftily. <laughs> if you're a crafter, I was in sales and I've learned how to say things in a way if the Lord gives me wisdom that it was so gentle you didn't realize that I had my hand in your pocket. But I, you can do that. You can learn to say, oh, let's pray for Kelly Kale. God bless her. We sure all know she needs it, don't we? <laughs> and so what did I just say? I just said, she's a mess. And those of us who are not, let's look down from our thrones. <laughs> See what I'm saying? I picked on Kelly because I knew she would let me. She smiled, so I'm okay. I did that. I just, slick, I just I slicked and smoothed this little thing. And when I did, I sensed that pressure of God just back off and He was no more. It was the emptiest I've ever been in my life. I repented of it right away. But the emptiness was still there. I went and holed up for two, two and a half hours praying and I got no feeling, I got no sense of the Holy Spirit. I got no sense of anything. He has left me alone for a time or he's given me the freedom that he's left me alone for a time and it's the loneliest place I've ever been in my whole life. I called this person that did not know that I had done that about them. I confessed that I had and I told them that I'm sorry. And they forgave me. And there was still no help. The Bible says God will not always strive with us. Yeah. Does anybody have that on your refrigerator? Probably. God will not always strive with us. Yeah. He will finally say in every person's life, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Have you ever had to do that with your children? It's not a good thing, is it? We don't ever want to be that place. I can tell you, you never want to be that place in your life. So what's the key? So what, what's, the, what's the key? The key to me is our simple things. There is a verse in Philippians, and I forgot to look it up, but I've memorized it. I've said it so many times. 
For it is God who is at work in you, both the will and to do His good pleasure. When I sense that thing, that leading of God, I know that God is about to be pleased if I can get out of the way. God is about to work a pleasing thing in this little old sinner man's heart. If only I can just respond to Him. You can look at it this way. I hold the pleasure of God in my power to some degree. If I respond to Him immediately, I can give Him pleasure. The quicker I can say, Lord, not my will, but Thine be done. And mean it and do it. The the more pleasure He receives from me and, may I say, the more freedom He has to work in me. Kelly, you work with young kids. You have a child that you just suggest to them and they just do it. It's okay to answer. Do you have one? Have you ever heard of a child? Not that you have one. But you give them instruction, 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 and they resist you every step of the way. See, I'm looking at daycare, two daycare people in a row, shooting right through one to get the other. And they're both going, I know exactly what you're talking about. Which one of them is that brings you pleasure? Uh, everybody else doesn't even wait for their response. We have the ability to b- bring pleasure to God if we'll respond immediately and let Him will, let Him do for His good pleasure. God is in search of just exactly a people like that. They don't have to be smart. They don't have to be rich. They don't have to be young. They don't have to have high IQs. They can have a past as checkered as Madras on Monday, if they will do now, if they will let God have His will and have His way. There's one more area I want to touch on because I need to. It's not, it's not the center of the message, but I, need, I think that I need that you consider it. God tells us That when the opposition comes, not from him, but from others, we deal with it very differently. When the opposition comes to him, we submit and we let him do it. When we have opposition, when we meet spiritual opposition, we we treat it differently. We stand in the gap on the ground that we believe is right. But we deal gently with the other people. The Bible says a gentle answer turns away wrath. When you're looking at somebody and they are absolutely, if they had horns and a pitchfork, it would be clear whose side they're on. And you know that, you discern that. Be gentle with them. Be patient with them. Be kind to them. Be loving, be forgiving, be understanding with them. Always holding the ground as to what is right, but being so gentle with them that you give them room to change in their heart and come along Christ and walk right with you. And they don't have to face discomfort between themselves and you. My wife loved me that way. I came to the Lord. When she saw me as wrong as a man can possibly be, she never faced me in my wrongness. She loved me through my wrongness and took that opposition that I was bringing into our house. And she took it to the Lord and let the Lord take care of it. And in His time, He took care of it. There's so much more that I'd like to say to you, but I'm afraid that if I do, I'll lose the ground we've already gained. I learned in sales. They told us one of the most difficult lessons to learn. A salesman spends 20% of his time telling you, convincing you to do it. And then because he can't shut up, the last 80% of his time convinces you not to do it at all. So if the first was 20%, let's hope it was, Let's, let's set the rest aside. Let God be God in your heart. 
Is it really that simple? That message could have been five seconds long. <laughs> if we could have digested it, it could have been five seconds and it might have been the best message forever. The way it is, it went on and on and on. And who knows if anybody will ever do it again. But let's get the kernel of it going. Amen. How many are ready? Amen. Amen. Jesus, I pray that you'll help us not to set up camp in the land of indecision, Amen. in the land of procrastination, Amen. in the land of stubborn nation. Lord, help us just to be so easy to work with that we hear your voice, we know your voice, and boom, we just say, yes, Lord, yes, to your will, to your way, your plan, your purpose, your giving, whatever it is, Lord, help us not to resist you. Help us not to kick against the goads, kick against the pricks, as I think the King James says. Help us, Lord, just to go with your flow. Mm -hmm. Help us, Lord, to, to, to just sit down and, and come to rest in our own personal spirit and determine we're going to follow you wherever you lead. And we thank you, Lord, for this day. Whatever was good, whatever was true, whatever was honorable today, plant it in our hearts, we pray. And let it never be lost. And let it be applied your name and for your sake. Amen. Amen. Amen.